Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Street Fighter, the movie, thoughts. So, Carlos Blanca has his mind reprogrammed with, you know, violent imagery. I personally love that Dr. Dalson, who morphs into Gandhi at the end of the movie for no discernible reason, you know, Dalson is like talking about, you know, oh, I, you know, my sciences have been perverted to evil. Was he a scientist in the games? I've, I've played the, you know, Street Fighter 2, which this was an adaptation of, several times. He's the guy with long arms. He looks like a witch doctor. Is he a scientist? Anyway, you know, when he points that out, Bison is actually kind enough to promise that he'll try to help him get published, you know. Nice guy. Anyway, the retraining of Blanco, you know, at first it's all this violent footage, but then, you know, halfway through, Dalsim manages to reprogram it with this lovely cuddly footage that I'm not entirely sure why they had around. I guess they wanted to train cuddly big teddy bears as well. Yeah. I don't blame Bison, though, for, you know, smashing the screen, which is pretty hysterical, by the way, when he realizes, you know, when, when he sees this footage of laughing and smiling little children. That tends to have the same effect on me. Does anybody else notice how much stuff in this movie actually happens by accident? You know, basically, you know, in the big assault by the end of the film, Guile has, like, just run out of bullets. So he grabs his knife and he throws it into the back of this one guy. And this one guy falls over, lands on the alert lever, I guess, and it was pulled up, which makes it go to yellow alert. And he lands on it, which pushes, pushes it down, and that makes it go to red alert. So, you know, Gal either shouldn't have thrown that knife, or, I don't know, was the guy already running for that handle? You know, but yeah, a bunch of stuff like that. I also question the decision to, you know, one thing is that Chun-Li flirts with the, you know, I think it's Ken. Yeah, I believe it's Ken she flirts with. But the two are always, you know, in the same place. It's like Mary-Kate and Ashley. You know, if you want separate identities, you gotta actually appear in separate scenes at some point. You know, you, you can't always just be next to each other. Anyway, I guess basically she flirts with him because she does think he's a good guy. Even though she saw him shoot Guile. Oh wait, yeah, she knows that that was a fake. Anyway, so basically I guess they want them to live. So they send them back to the party that's going to get blown up? Or was that Ken and Ryu's own brilliant decision there? You know, yeah, I, I fail to see what the problem would have been if they hadn't gone right back into the room they had just been told was going to blow up. Why don't they, like you know, trying to make sure no one actually leaves instead of just walking straight into this Mexican standoff, you know. By the way, I guess the guns that Sagat was selling Bison wasn't supposed to come from Ken and Ryu because the guns that he sells to Bison seem to be the real deal. Yeah. And then there's the strange call of airing on television that you're about to blow Bison up. 
you know, I, again, on the off chance that a television set was on at the party loud enough for people to hear it, and at, you know, set to that exact channel, that's a lot of coincidences. Anyway, they do go ahead and give away that, you know, they're going to blow them up. I don't quite understand why you don't just... I, I get, you know, being proud of having blown them up, but you want to wait to, you know, with recording that victory message until you're actually sure you've blown them up? And I guess they were fine with, you know, killing the innocents that had to run out of the way of the, you know, explosive truck by the, or van, I guess it was a van. I'm also not entirely sure their count of ten minutes was in any way accurate. It seems more like two, but whatever. What camera was shooting, you know, the alternate angle? And I'm not talking about when we, the audience, see the truck van. The van truck approach. I'm talking about when the truck van was being shot from the front, and you see that on the TV screen. Who is shooting that footage? What cameraman is stupid enough to get in front of that? You know, it might be good footage, which, I don't well, know, it isn't. Still, not worth risking your life over. The... The San... San... San Jif? Mr. Z. Mr. Z's treatment in this... I don't know, I... I remember him from the games as well. You know, he seemed pretty cool there, and he does at least get to do a little fighting, although I wish that they didn't play the big match between him and the sumo wrestler up for laughs. I, that would have been kind of cool to just do properly, you know. But, yeah, it, he's apparently really stupid in this, and the moment that DJ tells him, no, we're working for the bad guy, he instantly just believes it. You know, there's not like a brief, you know, I get they didn't have time for an argument or a discussion or something, but it's just like, he just has to be told, and he immediately believes it, and yeah, that, yeah. There are some really awkward lines, like, you know, Sagat revealing that he is, what was it called, Iron Fist, I think, you know, they talk about how Vega is really popular, and Sagat claims, greatest fighter since Iron Fist, what happened to him, he retired and became me. Yeah, that is a really awkward phrasing there. You know, how, how about you just say, I retired, or something like that. You know, he, he became me. He became a one-eyed gun runner. That was his grand transformation. M. Bison apparently has more cameras around the world than the freaking Shredder from the 80s Turtles cartoon. Seriously, everything he, you know, Anytime he wants to see something, there's just a camera there. There's a camera inside Guile's, you know, little stealth boat, which we don't know exactly how the stealth works, although it definitely causes some, you know, waves of electricity to course over the boat. But it is apparently so unsafe that you have to have a visor in front of your face in order to turn it on. Not actually run it, but in order to turn it on, that's apparently the, the real risky point, you know. He's got a camera at the radar stations. Why isn't someone just watching those cameras, you know, instead of, yeah, 
well, radar is good as well, of course, but why not have some men watching those cameras? You know, we, we see plenty of his men just going around his, you know, fortress. I love that one guy who's like, at one point, walking in front of the big monitor he's got, which is made of, of like, I don't know, 9, 12 TVs, you know. I don't know what that guy, what that guy's guarding, but it, yeah, that, you know, you should have a guard anywhere, even in front of a big TV, because, I don't know, people steal TVs, you know, could happen. Yeah, is that more or less what there is to say? You gotta love how, like, the one match that really feels like this is something that would have happened in the game. And that would basically have been a street fight. You know, Vega versus Ryu in the cage. That really looked like it was gonna be where the, the film lives up to its title and to what it's an adaptation of. But no, it's stopped by Guile, who thusly, you know, lets us know that he's gonna be an annoying jerk for this movie, you know. You gotta love how after he takes out the assassin from the Shadaloo Tong, you know, the, apparently the Mafia, which I guess Sagat is running or at least a member of something like that. You know, Guile takes him out, and then he looks around. Any other new business? Um, sir, we were discussing the attack plan. It wasn't really, you know, we had already kind of done the whole what is the new business stuff, but but okay, you want to get a one-liner in there. That's, that's good. And, you know, if... Sagat won't listen to new friends. Maybe he'll listen to new enemies. Yes, yeah, the irony works better when what you're saying actually does make sense. So yeah, you may want to practice there. I do love how he somehow already has the line ready when, you know, the reporter is the one to find him. He's like, you know, he instantly has the line about, oh, I'm not going to give you an If I wasn't going to give you an interview when I was alive, I sure won't give you now one now that I'm dead. The boxer and the sumo wrestler, I just love how, like, again, their motivation is, of course, revenge. You know, they have a personal stake in it because that's as deep as this movie ever gets. You know, I'm, I'm not saying it should be real deep and stuff, but it is a, you know, it's an arcade fighting game adaptation so yeah but is that really the most interesting backstory you can possibly come up with and i just love how it's not even like motivated it's just the shadow tong ruined our reputations why it ruined our reputations shut up just just go with it chun li surprising bison and you know kicking his ass is pretty cool. It's a real cop-out how she's stopped by, you know, the sumo wrestler yelling her name, but yeah. And, you know, the thing about how, like, I don't know, is that supposed to, like, set up some thematic of you shouldn't seek out revenge, you know, this is, it's not, you know, gonna work out because she's, like, blinded and then, but it's only because she stopped that it doesn't work. If she'd have killed Bison right there, the film would have just ended sooner, you know, presumably. It would have been fine. You know, it's not like she got in a lot of trouble for that. But, you know, sure enough, they're locked inside. Gotta love the fade from, like, the, you know, the skull... What's it called? Fireplace. Gotta love that. I want one of those. I want a big skull fireplace. Anyway, fade from that to the manic laughing face of M. Bison as they all fall prey to the gas. Who the sumo wrestler, 
you know, the sumo wrestler was the first to notice it and the one who could outlast it the longest. I don't know, I guess he's no stranger to gas. Anyway, yeah, was that supposed to, like, set up some big thematic about you shouldn't seek revenge? Because isn't that kind of what Guile is doing, you know, when he, you know, fights Bison personally and all that stuff? Isn't that, like, I want revenge for Blanca and, again, that kind of works out fine, so, yeah. And then we have the after, the, the after school special of, you know... Ken could have become Sagat if he hadn't met him, and now he's not going to be like him because he saves Ryu, because saving his friend is as good, you know, because that's like, that's the motivation, you know, he finds out his friend is in trouble, so now he wants to help all people, apparently. Yeah, because his friend wants to help people. I don't know, I, honestly, I think it's like they have a contract. They have to be in the same shot. Pretty much every time one of them is in a shot. So, really, you know, if Ryu is going to save people, Ken is going to have to save people, whether he likes it or not. But yeah, you have, like, heroic moments of, you know, the boxer punching the... You know, that just makes perfect sense, of course. He punches the locking mechanism for where the hostages are, you know, and that opens the door faster than Cammy could have done. So, yeah. Again, that really, that didn't need to be him. And, yeah. Also, gotta love how it's so obviously choreographed. If you want to have fun, you should make a drinking game out of every single time someone literally runs right into their punch or kick, you know. When, when an enemy runs directly into one of the hero's fists, take a shot. Because it happens all over the place. You know, a bunch of these guys, most of these guys have got, excuse me, I don't know where they learned how to fire them, but no one taught them how to aim because they aim worse than stormtroopers and just like every single hero, every single villain goon firing at a lead in any Hollywood movie ever combined. They just, they have every chance of hitting Guile. He isn't even trying you know, to dodge them. Whenever he shoots, he takes out someone. A couple of times, people go down, enemy guards go down even without being shot. That happens at least once in this movie. I think it's in the corridors near the, ver the very end. Anyway, you know, and gotta love how, you know, Guile can actually sort of make it work when he swings on a vine. When Bison does it, you're on the floor laughing so hard you're practically crying. Anyway, and, and then, you know, a bunch of them storm out of a door, aiming at Guile. No one takes a shot. Not one, you know. That was the one time they couldn't have explained away how they don't hit. But, but yeah, literally, so many of these guards just basically s slam their head into the fist or you know, kicking foot or, you know, of the heroes. It's, yeah, it's a lot of fun to watch for. Gotta love the bureaucrat, you know, the, that guy from the first, the second Ace Ventura movie. I'm pretty sure it's him as this really British guy, because, you know, the British are just wussies, apparently, you know. Yeah, I, I think the people who wrote this forgot about, you know, World War II. Yeah. But anyway, he's, you know, so he tries to talk them out of it, and, you know, he fires Guile from one second to another, and, yeah, doesn't that actually kind of mean that 
the army did give in to Bison's demands, you know, his kind of big speech about, you know, th that, that big thing of, oh, they didn't give in to Bison's demands. Yeah, they did. They just weren't allowed to follow through on it, you know. They weren't going to actually make it in time for the deadline, but they were already caving. And then, you know, you have the brief gag of, oh no, I talked him out of taking all the men. Oh yes, the rest are back at the base. And then you see this, the, the chef, who's like, you know, I don't know, taking care of this part of a stew or something. Who is he cooking for? I don't, is, is he that brain dead that he doesn't realize there's no one there to eat his food? Is he just really personally hungry? I get that it's like, oh, he's the only one left, but, you know, I don't know, wouldn't it have been better if he, like, only just now realized, you know, he's, like, coming out to serve and then there's no one there and he's, like, you know, he didn't even notice or something? Why is he still sitting there? That's a genuine... I. I feel like someone should go tell him that there's no one around him to eat. I, I feel bad for the guy. Yeah, I think that pretty well covers the film. Well, Bison's theatrical speeches. You gotta love. This guy takes every single possible opportunity to have a big dramatic theatrical speech you know I guess whenever you don't see him he's mentally composing these grand speeches or something he's because they're wordy they're they're elaborate you know you gotta love how you know the the countdown closes and he's like your bosses think of me as a wild animal so be it you will be devoured by a wild animal because you don't deserve to be executed by a firing squad. I just randomly decided that and I'm not going to explain why. It is, just, it is just priceless, you know. I can't follow this guy's logic at all. Just on that, at least, you know, and the, you know... And one of the jokes that, it, that are actually a little funny is, you know, when he's looking at the model of his, you know, future compound, or the, the world. The food court should be bigger. You know, that's, yeah, that's kind of a funny line. And, you know, one of the intentionally funny ones. Zanchev, Mr. Z, holding up the door there at the end. That would have been a good moment if his sudden conversion to the good guy side wasn't so incredulous. You know, I just don't believe that this guy, if he's stupid enough to not realize that he's working for the bad guy, is he really smart enough? to start working for the good guys, or, you know, yeah, that just, really, that could have been a, a pretty good moment. And then the thing with, you know, oh, he holds the, you know, he doesn't do a thumb up, he does a thumb sideways. That is all wrong. Yeah. That's a strange joke. Ryu and Ken tricking Sagat with, uh, you know, you also gotta love just the, you know, it's, it's because Ryu sets him up to say, you know, oh no, I already know where the weapons are, because Sagat gives them the money. I don't know why. And then they're like walking away, and Ryu's like, you need this, you know, holding up the, what's it called, you know, radio thing. Huh. 
what's going on with that radio? And I just gotta wonder, what if he hadn't said anything? Would Sagat just have let them walk away and then when they radio in, he would have been like, uh, I already have your weapons, I, I guess I should have said this earlier. But yeah, you know, so the weapons are fake and, you know, it's just, they shoot rubber balls or something and yeah. And yet there's still that one bit during the fight where someone is aimed at, you know, I think it's Ken being aimed at and it fires and it's still a rubber ball, you know, it was that supposed to be like tense? Or was it, again, it's like this weird throwaway gag that really isn't all that funny. And, you know, you gotta love how the motivation or sort of, you know, character development of Ken and Ryu tell themselves that, well, they're robbing the bad guys, so that makes them good guys. That's literally in Guile's file, you know, neither of them say it, or, you know, and it's not just that he suggests it, he literally looks at the file, and he's like, ah, oh, yeah, that's how you... How does that make any sense? Were they captured at some point, and like a psychologist prodded them, and eventually that's what they gave as their response, as, as their reasoning, that is just deliciously nonsensical, you know, it is just, and, you know, that bit does also have one of the few good lines, and good sort of one-liners, the only way the two of you are leaving here is over my dead body, you know, and that was a really well-planned staged escape too. So basically, either the guard who, I think it was Ryu who got the keys, either that guard knew or Ryu was just that good at getting those keys. And I have a hard time believing that because it wasn't just like one key for, you know, the prisoner, you know, handcuffs. I don't know, how, how do they justify releasing all those other people in the truck, by the way? Anyway, it wasn't just that one key, it was a big bundle of keys. That guy would have noticed if he suddenly wasn't carrying these keys anymore. Did the other couple of guards there, were they in on it as well, you know? What if they had noticed, would God have been like, no, no, I mean, it's, oh crap. Then you have, like, I get that it's, I don't remember his name, T-Hawk is what they call him, I think. And near the end, he's wearing, like, this you know, Native American kind of outfit. I'm pretty sure he's from the game. He's the one who gets up on the truck, you know, the, the prisoner truck, as, it try, as they try to escape. And that's where Ken gets the gun that he then shoots Guile with. And, you know, yeah, that was fake and staged. So Hawk knew it knew it, and they had made sure that the gun was firing blanks. Also, how much time did it take them to plan all this, you know? It's not entirely clear what the timeline is, but all this is taking place within three days, so I guess it was a couple of hours. I guess they just have blanks and, you know, what's it called? Squibs laying around. Electronically controlled squibs, uh, F, you know, it would appear. I don't know how else they, you know, made sure to... Yeah, anyway. And, yeah, so they had to make sure that no one but Hawk got up on the, you know, the, the truck. And if Hawk hadn't stopped the, you know, the soldiers from shooting, they might have hit Ken, or I guess Guile. But... Yeah, that whole thing, you know, the truck might have run over some AN soldiers as it, you know, the whole thing is just, how do they actually manage to get away with this stuff? How exactly does this elaborately staged plan work out and, yeah. 
And then, you know, Chun-Li, not long before she dons her ninja outfit, she throws a wireless microphone that they can track into the, you know... Yeah, she, she throws it... There, there's this curve in... It's fabric, okay? It's fabric covering part of the truck. And there's a curve in it, and she throws it in there. The truck is driving fast. I call BS on that microphone actually staying put. You know, if there had been like she had, I don't know, if it had stuck to like the metal, if it had been magnetic or something, that would maybe work. But as it is, yeah. I'm also not entirely clear on where they're getting all their resources, you know, this little news crew, none of whom are you know, reporters in the games, I'm pretty sure. You know, they have the little van, they have, they've got passports, they, you know, they have this elaborate show kind of, you know, they, they have these outfits, and Chun-Li looks really hot when she's, you know, when they're doing that little trick there. Great legs on her. Anyway, yeah, where where are they getting all this? Yeah, I'm also not entirely clear why they choose to just, you know, ram the truck with the explosives down there instead of just sneaking the explosives close by and then, you know, I don't know, I guess they might not be able to detonate it from... Afar, at least with the... I don't know, can't they get a gun and just shoot at some of it? Or, you know, use gunpowder to make a crude... What's it called? Fuse? Something? Or at least not announce their intentions on TV before they do it. That also is one slightly humorous line. If you enjoy Mr. Z as this complete moron, the quick change the channel line. Yeah. And I suppose that does pretty well cover everything in the film. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.